So now that we've seen some basics of gravity, I'm going to combine the uh, things from rotational physics that we've seen previously uh, with the uh, new understanding of gravity that we have. So, and specifically how the two of those things together result in orbital motion. So this will be a lesson about orbital mechanics. So what do we mean? For example, we have the sun and the earth. The Earth orbits around the sun. Uh, but what is causing that orbit is the force of gravity. So uh, from Newton's laws, we know that uh, an object in motion will stay in motion and an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by a force. Um, but what makes the Earth go in a circle instead of just going straight off into space? So this is an example of a force that is making the object change direction, but not necessarily making it change its speed. So there's a force of gravity pulling in this direction. And we know that the force of gravity is G M one M two over R squared. So the radius is this distance from the earth to the sun. M one will we can say is the mass of the sun and M two is the mass of the Earth, G is the gravitational constant. Okay, so this doesn't necessarily explain why this is going in a circle, because if you just had this force, the Earth would just fall into the sun and we would all have a bad day. So there has to be some velocity that's perpendicular to this force. And so as the earth goes around, you see that the, so if the force is pushing towards the sun and our velocity is perpendicular to that, then the resulting vector would just see the earth continue to go around the sun like this. And you can keep doing that all the way around uh, with your vector addition. So in effect, the earth is trying to fall into the sun, but because it has this residual velocity, it goes around in this circular motion instead. Now, when something is moving around in a circle, we can define that motion as a special type of motion called uniform circular motion. And so for now, we'll just assume that the Earth is, that the Earth's orbit is circular. It's ever so slightly eccentric, making it a, um, an ellipse instead of a circle. But just to keep the math easy, we'll assume that it's a circle. And so for uniform circular motion, like we had with the Earth going around the sun,
the acceleration that points towards the center of its orbit is called the uh, centripetal acceleration. And in uniform circular motion, the centripetal acceleration is related to the tangential velocity, which is the velocity that points perpendicular to the centripetal acceleration, like this, dt squared over r, where r is the radius of this circular orbit. So now we know the force of gravity, and now we have an expression for centripetal acceleration, we can derive one of Kepler's laws. So this is specifically going to be Kepler's third law. And this uh, relates the period of a planet's orbit, so how long it takes to orbit uh, versus its distance away from the star. And so canonically it's written like this, t squared is proportional to r cubed, so this is the period. This symbol just means proportional to And this is the orbital distance, I guess we'll call it, or orbital radius. So we can derive that uh, just by setting our gravitational force equal to the centripetal force. So the gravitational force we've seen is G M one, and I'll just write big M as the the thing that is the the bigger mass, and little M is the smaller mass over R squared, and then the centripetal force is M A C. So you see the the mass of the planet doesn't factor in. And now we can rewrite the centripetal acceleration as the tangential velocity squared over r. Now, if we are doing uniform circular motion, the time it would take to do one orbit, so to go all the way around, let's call that period the period, so T, so this is time to go around once. And we know that this distance has to be 2 pi r because that's the circumference of a circle. So if we want the velocity, we can just take the distance divided by the time. The distance is 2 pi r. The um, time is the period. Now we have another expression for the tangential velocity. So we can plug that into our equation for tangential velocity.
Okay. And now let's uh, solve for the period, I guess. I think that would be the best variable to isolate. So we have gm over r squared equals um, 2 pi r over period squared over r. So let's cancel one of those r's. And then we'll square this. Square everything. So that would be 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. So solving for t, we would move t to the other side. This r and this r would multiply. We would get 4 pi squared g m r cubed. And so all of this you could just take for a constant and you would get t squared is proportional to r cubed, which is exactly what Kepler's third law says. So that's one application of uh, uniform circular motion and how it can apply to something like astronomy. Now I want to show another interesting uh, consequence of all of this. So we have that the force of gravity is g m m over r squared. And we know that the potential energy due to gravity is negative g m m over r. So if we wanted to know the total orbital energy of something, so what is the orbital energy of say a satellite or a planet? We know there's gonna be gravity. That's what's making it rotate or orbit. And then we know that it's moving with some velocity, so there's going to have to be some kinetic energy. So we have negative g m m over r plus one half m. Oops. M v squared. And I want to highlight this v squared term and remind you that the centripetal acceleration was defined as v squared over r. So if we wanted to solve this for v squared, we would get r times ac. And if we set our gravitational force equal to the centripetal force, MAC, the mass of the orbiting body gets canceled out and you're just left with the centripetal acceleration equals GM over R squared. which we can plug in for AC to get G M R over R squared. So V squared equals G M over R. And we can plug this V squared into our total energy. 
So our total energy was G negative G M M over R plus one half M V squared. We have a value to place to replace the V squared, which is G M over R. Now we have negative g m m over r plus one half g m m over r. So the total energy of a an orbiting body is negative one half g m m over r. And so you may be wondering what this um, this negative energy that we had for the gravitational potential energy means. And what this is telling us is that your, as you get, if we move farther away from whatever we're orbiting, that would make our radius get bigger. And so a bigger number in the denominator is going to make this whole thing smaller, but because it's negative, instead of getting smaller, you're just getting closer to zero. Uh, so what this is telling us is that the farther away we move from some object, the uh, less we're gonna be influenced by that gravity. So, as a, a consequence of all of this, the total energy of an orbiting body, uh, meaning it's combining its velocity and its potential energy due to gravity, uh, can be written as just one term like this. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.